The panel is titled News from Nowhere, Inter Intergenerational Trauma and Procession. Uh, this is moderated by our newly appointed senior curator, Storm Janssen van Rensburg. Uh, who gave up his life in the United States to join us here in South Africa, and we're very grateful. Um, Janse van Rensburg is a curator of contemporary art working in an international context. He began his career at the Market Theatre Galleries, Johannesburg, and served as a curator of the KwaZulu-Natal Society of the Arts in Durban. He was a founding member of the Visual Arts Network of South Africa and senior curator at Goodman Gallery from 2007 to 2012. Uh, he lived and worked in in Berlin, Germany from 2012 to 2015 as an independent curator and researcher and worked with leading institutions in the city such as Savvy Contemporary and House de Culture in Develt. Uh, he was a fellow of the Academy for Advanced African Studies in Beirut um, and co-curated projects there as well. He's edited and written for a number of exhibition catalogues and journals. Uh, as head curator of exhibitions at the Savannah College of Art and Design, SCAD Savannah, from 2015 to 2019, he was responsible responsible for a group exhibition celebrating the centennial of the life and legacy of Jacob Lawrence in 2017. Other group exhibitions at the museum include In Passing, American Landscape Photograph, and Frederick Douglass, Embers of Freedom, developed collaboratively with curatorial colleagues among numerous other solo exhibitions by leading international artists. He currently serves, as I says, as our senior curator here at Zeitz Mocha. And he will be joined by Nkule Mabaso, Premesh Lalu, Michael Godby and Andrew Lamprecht. If I can hand over to Storm. Thank you. No one wants to sit next to me. Um, <laughs> thank you, Michael. Um, it's a, a tremendous pleasure to be here today, um, but also to be back home. Um, and more ways than one. Um, so thank you also for the warm welcome, Tammy. Um, it's been amazing to work with you. I think um, an amazing group of curators here at Zeitz Mocha. Um, they've also, I mean, I know thanks for coming, but they've done a sterling job in the convening of this event today as well. Um, so really just kind of diving, you know, into a kind of a wonderful, you know, um, discursive moment also for the institution. Um, so our title is a, is a loose framework um, that in, with our panelists today will be engaged with specifically and also quite generically. And I think we have um, really wonderful panelists here that's going to share their um, insights with it. Um, Art in the State of Siege, Trauma and Procession in the Work of Kentridge and his Contemporaries. Of course, the procession, um, there's a floor dedicated here at the museum broadly to the theme of um, the procession. Of course, in William's work, it is between the political, um, the religious, um, also the performative, um, the celebratory. Um, so where these things come together, I think where a lot of the, the power of this particular image or kind of thematic lies. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our wonderful panelists to you. Um, and the order that they're going to present. Um, so on my immediate left here is Michael Godby, who is Emeritus Professor of History of Art at the University of Cape Town, and he has written extensively on, on William. Um, he received his BA from Trinity College Dublin, his MA from Birmingham University, and his PhD from Witwatersrand University. He has published and lectured on early Renaissance art, English 18th century art, but particularly William Hogarth, 19th and 20th century South African art and the history of South African photography. He's also active as a curator. Um, sitting next to him is Andrew Lamprecht. Um, Andrew, um, also a dear friend. Um, Michael as well, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's really wonderful to engage with you, Andrew, on this panel. Um, Andrew has once sent me as his proxy to uh, uh, a, a conference in Paris. Um, thank you for that free trip, Andrew. Um, <laughs> um, Andrew has taught at the University of Cape Town, UCT, uh, Michaela School of Fine Arts since 1998, where he established the Discourse of Art stream on which he has taught consistently from that time. In addition, he has taught theory and practice of art and visual and art history courses, also very active in support of young contemporary artists um, in the city. Um, next to him is Pramesh Lalu. 
Um, Pramesh, um, our last engagement was in Berlin, so really great to be on the stage with you again. Uh, Pramesh is Director of the Department of Science and Technology um, and National Research Foundation Flagship Center. He was, so he recently um, stepped... If he's free now, great. Um, but did a tremendous work at the um, Research Foundation Flagship Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape, um, leaving an incredible legacy there. Um, following a master's degree from the University of the West Western Cape, he was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Doctoral Fellowship to read towards a doctorate in history at the University of Minnesota. After 16 years at UWC in the Department of History as an associate professor, Lalu was awarded an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant to convene a fellowship program in the study of the hum humanities in Africa. Of course, also widely published um, in, his, in his field. Um, and then a wonderful um, warm welcome to Nkule Mabaso. Thank you very much for joining us, Nkule. Uh, she graduated with a fine arts degree from the University of Cape Town in 2011 and received a master's degree at the postgraduate program in curating at ZHDK in Zurich in 2014. Mabasa is currently the curator at UCT's Michaelis Galleries, and in 2017 she collaborated with the art historian Manon Brat to, towards the realization of the exhibition and publication Tell Freedom, 15 South African artists aboard, uh, sorry, 15 South African artists based on a curatorial project Tell Freedom, which was exhibited at the Kunsthalle KDE, Amersfoort in the Netherlands. Um, most recently, um, Mabaso was part of, uh, she is part of the Natal Collective um, that curated the South African Pavilion, the, Strange, the Stronger We Become, at the 58th International Art Exhibition in Venice in 2019. Please help me to welcome this wonderful panel. <laughs> and I'm going to ask, hand over to, to Michael. Hello, good. Um, I'm glad that, that, that Storm read out the different title from, from the one that is on your screens because the title that I'm actually working with is, is Art in a State of Siege, Trauma and Procession in the Work of Kentridge and His Contemporaries. Uh, I won't be talking about his contemporaries. So there's quite enough to talk about and more in the work of Kentridge, of course. What I want to do in this presentation, and time is limited, is to pick up from the title a reference to a lecture that Kentridge gave in 1986 and to, to ask what that state of siege is in his imagination then and what it may be now. Then I want to shift to the next stage of the title, which is procession. So I'm looking there in vain, it's not there, of course. Um, trauma and procession in the work of, of, of Kentridge. I'll be looking at... Um, procession, some of, its, some of its history within his work. And then finally, I'll be looking at a particular example of a procession, the Triumphs and Laments um, mural in Rome that was completed in 2016. So first, um, and I have to say that, that in a way, this talk perhaps should have come before all the other talks in the, in the morning. I've uh, enjoyed them immensely. They were highly sophisticated, highly complicated, highly challenging. What I'm going to do is rather more simple, I think rather more basic. So here goes on that, on that level. Um, the lecture that, 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 that William gave in 1986 was called Art in a State of Grace, Art in a State of Hope, Art in a State of Siege. The silk screens, incidentally, that share those titles came a couple of years later. The first part of that triumvirate, if you like, Art in a State of Grace, obviously the point at which William wanted to dis distance his own practice from. Looking at European art, which he loves greatly, the masters such as Seurat, Tiepolo, Matisse, the color field abstractionists that he refers to, he talks about them as creating visions of a state of grace, an achieved paradise, a feeling of well-being with the world. In South Africa, he's quick to follow on, uh, more than most places, one's nose is rubbed every day in compromise the disease of the urbanity, as he calls it, uh, elsewhere. 
Then again on reflection he says, perhaps South Africa is not so different from other places at other times. Quote, it is always peasants who pay and purity is an illusion. The quotes that I'm making at this time are from the 1986 lecture. Moving then to art in a state of hope, uh, quickly, quickly covered, he looks at the image of the Tatlin monument and how that might be inspiring, but how that inspiration was portrayed in the course of the development of the Soviet Union thereafter. He then moves into our proper title, which is Art in a State of Siege, and quotes from uh, and refers to the work of one of his strongest inspirations, I think, Max Bexman. And I'm going to read this title, this, this paragraph um, to you, because I think it contains a lot of what William was thinking at that time, and rather a lot of what William, I think, still thinks uh, today. Max, this is William talking. Uh, Max Bexman's painting, Death, is a beacon for endangered souls. It accepts existence of a compromised society, and yet does not rule out all meaning or value nor pretend these compromises should be ignored. I think you'll pick up echoes in some of the conversations uh, this morning already. It marks a spot where optimism is kept in check and nihilism is kept at bay. It is in this narrow gap, he charts, that I see myself working, aware of and drawing sustenance from the anomaly of my position. At the edge of huge social um, upheavals, yet also removed from them not able to be part of these upheavals, nor to work as if they did not exist. This position of being neither active participant nor disinterested observer is the starting point and the area of my work. It is not necessarily the subject of it. The work itself is so many excursions around the edge of this position. And later on in the same um, in, in the same lecture, he says, its central characteristic is disjunction. The fact that daily living is made up of a non-stop flow of incomplete, contradictory elements, impulses, and sensations. We'll see that in that very phrasing, there's a definition for so much of the processions that, 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 that um, William works with. Kendridge, as I say, read this article in 1986, and his primary reference, of course, was to the condition of South Africa before the release of the political prisoners and, and the first democratic elections. It is quite a jump in time and space to the banks of Tiber in Rome in 2016, where the, the triumph of laments was made. But Kentridge is a child of the world, not just South Africa. Rome, one might think, is a suburb of Johannesburg, just like London, to paraphrase another remark that he made another time. And while those artists of his supposed state of grace, Sura, Tiepolo, and others, had hardly been problematized for him, he was, of course, aware, quote, that there, are, there were factories at the edge of the Seine where Sura was painting, and that in bad years, peasants starved in the countryside around Tiepolo's paintings, end quote. But in accepting the invitation to make a large work in Rome, Kentridge was able, in fact, he seems to have felt compelled to make that suppressed history his subject. We shall see the triumphs and laments interrogates that feeling of well-being with the world, the achieved paragraphs, the state of grace that is generally represented in the history of Rome. But first, a note on processions in Kentridge's work, as mentioned and this, uh, of course, has to be brief. Processions began with Kentridge in his drawings for projection. They constitute, if you like, the background, the political groundswell against which Felix Teitelbaum and Soho and Mrs. Eckstein act out their drama at the edge of huge social upheavals, yet also removed from them, to go back to uh, William's quote. These processions are a threatening presence, an inchoate mob that erupts occasionally into specific acts of violence, as in stereoscope, for example. William's sources for these processions were contemporary news footage of protest marches in the cities of South Africa, revolutionary crowd scenes in the movies of Eisenstein and Bertolucci, Novocento, for example, 
and the black paintings of Goya, specifically the pilgrimage to San Isidoro, the witch's Sabbath, and, and others. In later processions, Williams sought to retain the threatening, perhaps manic quality of these crowds, while also seeking to attribute specific identities to some of their component parts. Thus, in Develop, Catch Up, Even Surpass in 1990, he used an arc format to suggest continuous movement and introduced certain features that allowed individual figures to be identifiable, if not actually defined in terms of meaning. Workers weighed down by their load, disabled workers, miners in helmets, Harry, a figure that appears in uh, Kentridge's industry and idleness, who represents poverty and disenfranchisement, a figure exhorting the crowd with a megaphone, etc. Scattered through this procession from 1990 are details that make no literal sense, but which add several of them for the first time in a long history of his processions, random associations, and can I say flavors. A shower, for example, a hyena, a ladder, a naked woman dancing, etc. The madness, as I'm putting it, of, the, of this procession is explained only in part by the inscription of Haile Selassie's ex exhortation to Ethiopian workers to surpass the developed economies of the world. This procession, in other words, this early procession, merges the processions of social upheaval with a long history of processions in the Western world and elsewhere. One thinks of Carnival, Mardi Gras, in Cape Town, of course, Saturnalia of the slaves in ancient Rome, Petrarchan triumphs, Bacchic triumphs, triumphal entries of victorial generals into Rome, as we will see, the dance macabre on the inevitability of death, and less public displays, such as chain gangs of convicts, portage, porters, looking forward to the, uh, the head and the load, porters strung together carrying their heavy loads, slave gangs tied by yokes and chains. Processions, therefore, may be seen to be made up of two elements. The one, that is movement, easily becomes a metaphor for life, moving inexorably to its predetermined end. Kentridge has recently said on later iterations of the metaphor, quote, the procession is a form that records the fact that here in the 21st century, human foot power is still the primary means of locomotion, and we are still locked in the manual labor of individual bodies as a way of making the world. The other element, uh, end quote, the other element of the procession is variety in its constituent parts, ranging from drama to play, from tragedy to farce, but all contained within the overall structure of movement. In the image of the procession, in other words, Kentridge found a vehicle not just for the area in which he himself worked, but more generally for the present social condition. As he said in 1986, its central characteristic is disjunction, the fact that daily living is made up of a non-stop flow of incomplete contradictory elements, impulses, and sensations. I want to single out one more characteristic of Kentridge's processions that is particularly relevant, I think, in the current Zeitzmacher uh, exhibition. And that is um, uh, relevant to his work in Rome and more generally, and that is shadow. Shadow play also has a considerable history in art and entertainment. Indeed, William tells how all three of his children at one stage have contributed to making shadow puppets for certain performances. And even the family cat was enticed by fish paste on a table to walk across the field of projection. But more seriously, if one can say that, he has written at length and elsewhere that the shadow is the principal image in the story of Plato's cave, in which humankind is imagined to be tied down in such a way as it can see nothing else but the progress of shadow movement across a wall, and that it is the role of the philosopher or artist to bring humankind out of the cave and confront actual three-dimensional reality. Kentridge clearly is fascinated by the nature of the shadow, its relationship to reality, and the special quality it contributes to the theme of the procession. How much time do we have? 
Five minutes. Okay. Can we look at the... Um, yes. Here we are, the banks of the Tiber. Have we got... Uh, with the Triumphs and Laments mural, you can see it's lit up and uh, occupying about 500 meters of the, of the Lungano. In the background, noticeably, is the Dome of St. Peter's. And there's a clear reference within the structure and the, 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 the making of the mural uh, uh, to, to that High Renaissance monument. Behind one, as this photograph is taken, is the ghetto of, uh, of, of Rome that uh, William also references in, 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 in this work in one way or another. Um, the two things that I can do now, I can show you quickly a, a cut from the um, um, opening procession, the opening nights of the, of the mural, and I'll keep it down to a minute or two, if I may. Um, here we go. course gives a sense of the scale of the figures and the, the, the relationship to the, to, the, to, the, to the people walking in front. And obviously it it's constitutes three processions. The one still on the wall that we can see now. Um, the other is the procession of the actual people in front of it holding their, uh, holding their various insignia. And the third is the shadows that they cast on the, on, 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 on the wall. Um, I referred for a moment, a moment ago to the presence of St. Peter's in the background and as a reference to the historic Rome, uh, the Rome that one knows, that one visits, that one celebrates, and that is generally published by, uh, by the city and its tourism boards. William seems to want to engage with that image of Rome and actually question, uh, contradict the history of that is, uh, underlies that. He talks about the mural, and we're at the beginning of it now, quite near one of the bridges where it starts, as being an unrolled Trajan's column that was uh, put up by the Emperor Trajan to celebrate his victories in, the, uh, in, in uh, Dacia, in, in present-day Hungary. And uh, drawn from that column is the figure of the winged victory the figure on the left of this, this, this image, that is shown inscribing the victory onto her shield. In other words, history is being written, history is being recorded, history is being monumentalized when it gets to be transferred to, 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 to the column. Everything in the mural is designed to combat that sense of history. This is the temporary uh, ephemeral arrangement. Uh, I've just spoken with a friend who's seen seen it within the last month. It is fading. Uh, it is not the strength that it was made in, 19, in 2016. And it is designed actually to disappear uh, after 10 or so, so years. And it's well on that uh, way to disappearing. It is a mural that's not painted. As I'm sure you know, it is actually made out of mud. Uh, the grime from the, from the walls sandblasted, no, uh, airbrushed, air, what is it, air <laughs> vacuum. Uh, brushed away from uh, the wall, leaving the stenciled images behind. And of course, the, 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 the atmospheric um, dirt will return and obliterate the mural. So instead of history being written and made permanent, history here is made provisional and, uh, and, and tangential. And one sees that in the next image, uh, also which features the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who in on one level, he is at the center of Michelangelo's 
uh, Campidoglio and represents or symbolizes Rome in many ways, or certainly the empire, but in a sense is a fraud too because that statue that Michelangelo put there only survived the Middle Ages because it was believed to be Constantine, the first Christian emperor, not Marcus Aurelius. And secondly, about Marcus Aurelius, one could see that the, sorry, can you go back to the previous image? Um, the, about Marcus Aurelius, he was that great Stoic philosopher as well as being an emperor, one that William draws on quite often. His title, for example, Smoke, Ashes, Fable, is drawn from him. And he also, as a Stoic philosopher, talked about the temporary nature of earthly achievement, certainly earthly fame. So, uh, and you can see this beginning to develop in the third uh, character of this, this initial panel of the, of the mural. The horse um, is, uh, is not a triumphal horse entering into Rome. It is already turning into to a skeleton. Um, let me just show you one more panel and then I'll finish because I could go on. Back to the uh, previous one. The, in the center there is the, uh, in the left is the uh, she-wolf of Rome uh, that of course, um, nourished Romulus and Remus um, by, 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 by tradition. Um, later on in the mural, incidentally, Remus is represented murdered, as he was indeed by his brother, um, uh, William clearly pointing to trauma at the very foundation of Rome rather than the glorious history that survives in Romulus's name. Um, but he's turned the she-wolf into a sort of espresso dispenser, um, indicating something perhaps like the commercialization of tradition and so on. Next to that are the three um, figures drawn from Mantegna's Triumph of Caesar, now in Hampton Court, um, where carrying, carrying certainly the insignia of the regiments as they did in, um, um, uh, in, in ancient Roman triumphs, but also being made, the third one being made to carry a sewing machine, an image familiar to uh, to those who you know Kempton's more recent works. And then of course behind them is the she-wolf that has now turned into, into a skeleton. One could go on, but what one is looking at here is a challenge to narrative, a challenge to history, and a challenge to, to, uh, to, 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 mo to monuments, and in that sense, I suppose, uh, to the preservation of, of, of archive. In the very material that, are being, that is being used, shadow and mud on the one hand, but also rewriting the history of Rome in this essentially undermining or subversive way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, here we go. Thanks, Storm, thank you very much. Okay, um, thanks very much for inviting me here, and it's really lovely to be part of this, uh, this, this colloquium and seminar. Um, in terms of the title that's published for this, um, for this section, I'm gonna be talking about precision, um, specifically, and something about intergenerationality, but not necessarily trauma. Um, the trauma might become apparent at the end, but I don't know where I have a place to speak about trauma. Um, um, I don't have a space, I don't have a place to speak about black trauma, and I don't think, as far as I know, that there's any evidence of white trauma in William's work, so I'm, uh, I'll leave that out if that's all right. I'm gonna look quite specifically at, like Michael, um, at one particular um, work, which is more sweetly play the dance, um, uh, and I want to, I will mention other works, particularly the early drawings for projection and other works where processionals, um, uh, the procession and processional does, does appear. It's quite informal, it's just random notes, quite personal in places, but just bear with me. I just want to start by saying that the greatness of Kentridge as an artist is, is unquestioned and his contribution to both South African art and international art is, is without doubt. Um, in 1991, I saw for the first time one of uh, Kentridge's um, uh, drawings for projection at the Cape Town Triennale in, when it won the award. I think somewhat shocked some people that a, a video was winning an art exhibition, what was it doing, an uh, art competition, what was it doing there? Um, and I really liked it. Um, I thought it was the second best work on the exhibition, <laughs> on the competition. Um, and. Um, as, as Michael has alluded to, there's, you know, the, the very first drawing for projection in 1989 was um, uh, Johannesburg, second greatest city after Paris. So, um, and, and when I saw, uh, when I, when I, when I saw the, the, uh, the work at the Cape Town Triennale, 
immediately what came to mind was, was I was a, I was, I was in my, I was 21, and I used to watch a program called Pop Shop, which was on television, and that's where you saw, the only place you could see music videos. And I remember the video from Brothers in Arms in 1985, where the very similar technique to what William would use a few years later was used, which was quite worth seeing, a couple of little snippets, particularly the one we said in the First World War. And I made the, the assumption that this was somebody who was deeply ingrained in popular culture. Um, uh, and then in, uh, just, another, just another work, which isn't on the exhibition, and I, is in fact, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful works that William's ever made is the music video for Mango Grooves, Another Country, um, in 1993. I think the video was made in 1994. Um, you can Google it. It's on YouTube. I don't know if it's legally on YouTube, but it is there. Um, and it's quite a wonderful and moving thing to see. But as far as I know, and I might be wrong, that's more or less the first and last time that, that as far as I know, that, that William Kentridge really interacted with what, what we might call popular culture. This was, oh, by the way, the, another country was, I think, the hit song of South Africa that year. It was sung everywhere, and it, you know, it really um, was celebrated even internationally in that stage. It was hard for South African songs to be, you know, um, we were just entering into an international sphere of culture, I guess. Um, and what I noticed as I followed his career ever since then, reading, going to every exhibition I possibly could, reading as much as I could, and I, I don't know if there's anyone who's read everything that's written about William Kentridge, even William himself. It's the, it's the shelf at my university, the two or three shelves in my university library sort of dwarfs out all the other South African artists, which is interesting. Um, but what I did notice, though, is an increasing concern with what, and I'm using this word very carefully, with a Eurocentric point of view. I know this is a word that's maybe overused sometimes, and sometimes, and it needs to be very specific. And I'm not necessarily necessarily using it, necessarily using it in a derogatory way. What I'm saying is that I think that for, to a large degree, William Kentridge's outlook has Europe at the center in terms of the philosophical, intellectual, and cultural roots of it. He has said on many occasions um, that he that he ultimately Johannesburg and South Africa is where he draws his inspiration from, and I think that's correct. But the way it manifests is often through a kind of lens which could be seen as coming from European culture. I would and references what I think once would have been called would have been called high culture, um, opera. Um, uh, 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 plays by, 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 by modernist writers and things like that. Um, not the popular culture of Mango Groove, right? And I think what's happened even further is that there's this attempt, a desire, to even find obscure, um, paracanonical, if you like, just outside the canon works by well-known writers, composers, um, uh, uh, philosophers, etc., and to, to almost uh, revitalize them or to, 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 to give them a new voice. Um, very brilliantly and very beautifully. I don't think anyone who's seen um, uh, one, of, uh, one, of the, one of the Kentridge operas or, 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 or theater performances can doubt the absolute beauty, but it's still a niggling worry for me that there's this, there's this centering on European culture, European ideas. And I think it might have something to do with um, what I know uh, from, from the sources I've read of, of, the, of the environment in which he grew, grew up, in an extremely cultured environment. I imagine there must have been great access to, to um, uh, intellectuals, in, to uh, works of high culture musically and, and liter in, in terms of literature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's quite interesting because when I was like 12 or 13, I remember reading uh, Gogol for the first time. I took it out of Weiberg Public Library. I read The Overcoat, I remember first, and I really loved it. And I also remember going to Weinberg Public Library and taking out every box set of opera on LP. But I was a very strange child, and I was a bit of a nerd, and I was a bit, I, I kind of got beaten up in a few times for that kind of thing. I do distinctly remember, so there was a bit of trauma, um, but I do distinctly remember once somebody coming up to me in the hallway and saying, do you know um, the Smith and Morrissey? And I said, no, but I know, you know, Stravinsky or something like that. So I'm saying this because I think there is a kind of weird similarity, and that's why I've always enjoyed William's work, because I have access to some of those. I happen to have access as a privileged white kid who had access to extremely good public library reserved for white kids and adults to get that kind of 
to get that kind of culture. And certainly it didn't cross my mind at that time that there was a whole world of interesting other things out there. So I've always enjoyed William's work for that reason. So moving back to more sweetly play the dance, my question is, where is the processional? Where are the crowd scenes that occur in the early drawings for projection, like Johannesburg, Second Greatest City, um, the Mango Groove video, where you see this wonderful, these crowd scenes of the masses coming towards a sort of central place. Is that central place the art that is on the exhibition? Or is it something else? That's a question I, I, I pose. In preparation for this, um, for this presentation, I did a lot of trolling. Is that the right word? Trolling or scrolling on the internet. Um, uh, I went onto YouTube a lot. Um, because not all of us have the ability to uh, you know, fly off to, to Rome to, to see the originals and things like that. But I, I, I did look, I, I was very, t you know, and, and they are literally, it's wonderful, they are fan-made videos. Again, I'm sure this is copyright infringement, uh, Mr. Kentridge, if you're out there, but they're fan-made videos of people filming these processions, walking down and doing it. And I started to look at them, from all to, um, to Athens, you know, you can see these, everywhere that William's work is shown, people kind of obsessively want to photograph it or to record it. But what I noticed, which was disturbing, interesting, and worthy of comment, was, and particularly if you go to the YouTube video, look at the one in Athens, it pops up, most people are walking past and they're completely oblivious to the fact that there's a work of art happening, a very fine work of art happening next to them. They are at the Athens, I think it was the Athens Festival in 2017, and if somebody engaged with the work, they engage with taking a selfie of their own shadow against the work and kind of inserting themselves into it, which is maybe a very exciting thing and maybe very intentional as well. And that's an interesting way where popular culture starts seeing to, to, to interact with, um, with, with uh, Kentridge's work. It's become, the work therefore became a backdrop to a passing crowd, a series of shadows. But what again I ask of the people, what, where really do they have access to his work? Um, and when I say access, I mean not just physical access, the Zeitz Mako right now in Cape Town, if you're lucky enough, and many other public places next to the banks of the Tiber, etc. But I mean also a psychological access, an intellectual access, a historical access. Not many people know as much about Marcus Aurelius and, and Trajan's column as you do, Michael, or maybe the audience here. And that's, what's, that's what I mean when I, see, when I detect a certain Eurocentricity in this as well. And also, um, uh, uh, and this is where the intergenerational thing becomes quite interesting. I mean, one wonders that about the potential for a lack of influence of one of our greatest artists, where the references become more and more obscure. I think, for the majority of younger people in this country, or maybe in the world. I might be wrong, but that, that I, do, I, I do worry about. I'm not going to quote it in Latin, but there is a fantastic quote, one of my favorites, which is, the world has changed and we with it. And I wonder to what extent the world has changed dramatically. I have no doubt that in the great art history book, the kind of Helen Gardner, to use my background, of a hundred years hence, there will be a substantial section. It will be written by an AI bot on a quantum computer using machine learning, I have no doubt. But that's what I mean by the world has changed. But my question is, a drawing for projection which starts to, sh to, starts to fade into the background seems something of, a, of, a, of, a, of an unfortunate event. I don't, know, I don't know what one does about that or what one says. I wonder who really has the patience and the background and the info and the col uh, the uh, the confidence and the knowledge to sit or stand for a long time looking at William's works. And I, yeah, um, and, um, and I think there we see a certain flatness and surface and interleaving, which we see, for example, in his prints. Gertie the Dinosaur, a 1914 um, animation by Winsor McKay, um, really set the standard for artists making animations. And today we have the Family Guy, The Simpsons, um, Big Mouth, and Paradise PD, if you check Netflix out. Um, the I'd like to finish on an anecdote. I, about two or three days ago, I was working on this presentation and playing 
William Kentridge's, various forms of William Kentridge's work that I could find on YouTube obsessively on the television screen, which is shared by my housemate. He was, he's a computer programmer and he was working on the computer. I realized after about four hours of playing processional works that he had put on headphones to concentrate on his coding, which makes sense. So at the end, I think we got to about 7 p.m. and I decided to, I've done enough work for the day. Um, and I said to Steph, I'm sorry, I realized that might have been a bit like self-indulgent because he, his computer's right next to our, our communal TV. And I said, you know, I think you put something you want to put on and let's, you know, let's, let's do that. And there was half a bottle of vodka and, you know, and, and there we go. Well, we ended up, he, he started putting on, I think it was the family guy. This is an animation that you can find, what's called adult animation. And he ended with um, a Big Mouth, which could be described as a, as a very, very rude and naughty uh, program about puberty, masturbation, and growing hair in strange places where you didn't grow it before, with lots and lots of sexual references. It's scurrilous, it's obnoxious, um, but in many ways, I think it might be more engaging for the millennials and the 25-year-olds, because at the end of the day, not many people have reference to Trajan or to the history of Marcus Aurelius. A lot of people have, um, a lot of people have some kind of uh, relationship to puberty, masturbation, and growing hair in strange places. And indeed, as, as, as the morning light almost was coming up, but we looked at each other and said, I must explain, he's, he's much younger than me, he's, he's in his 20s, and we looked at him and both said, wow, this was quite nostalgic, you know, it brought back these memories. And it was one of those wonderful moments where, of intergenerational dialogue, I think, about something. The point was that the day before, my housemate had come of his own volition, without my encouragement or suggestion, to, to take on a date um, at the Zeitzmocker, where they decided to go and see the William Kentridge, which they'd heard so much about. And he asked me, is it a good idea? And I said, it's a fabulous idea. I asked him what the highlight of that, of that, of that visit was, after we had watched Family Guy and all these things. And he said to me, the highlight was finding a little, um, a little area down at the bottom, which has got, I think it's, it's got, um, uh, you go inside this little, it's not one of William Kentridge's works, but it's, it's, it's you go inside, it, he said, and there we stole a kiss. And I think that maybe speaks volumes, that that particular moment was for somebody who's not trained in art, not raised in a context of Western art history, philosophy, that was the moment in the Zeitzmacher and it was on Wednesday, the free day in the morning. Thank you for that, by the way. That's a brilliant thing. Um, that was the moment that was most memorable. Um, thank so you, thank Andrew. You. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to dive into... I'm sure there's a lot of questions for you right now. Um, <laughs> but I think... <laughs> let's go to the um, our next presenter, Pramesh. Um, you, are you okay there? Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pramesh. Thank you very much. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the long for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. As many of you know, Seamus Heaney read these lines on the occasion of Nelson Mandela's release from prison in 1990. I rediscovered the poem and the detail about its recitation while on a writing fellowship at Trinity College, Dublin, where I'd been working on a book on the uncanny returns of race. It proved fortuitous to happen upon Heaney's intricately woven cure at Troy in a museum established to honor the gift of his poetry while writing about the uncanny returns of race. The optimism of Heaney brought to mind how in the struggle to disavow race, the long for tidal wave that led to the abolition of slavery and the end of apartheid failed to deliver on a promise. If anything, race proved to be more durable than hope and history combined. Yet by the same token, Heaney left me wondering whether the end of apartheid in 1994 could fulfill the promise that was left unfulfilled with the end of slavery in 1834. Could the post-apartheid offer us an opportunity to find our way to a place where hope and history rhymed? If the desire for the post-apartheid seemed imperiled on both sides of the grave, the possibility of transcending race seemed an even more distant worry in Ireland. Many Irish believe fervently that Ireland is free of the problem of race, notwithstanding the history of British colonialism 
or evidence of Irish participation in the project of imperial expansion. Until, that is, Liam Neeson confessed to wanting to kill a black bastard following the rape of a close friend. Only then was the question of whether race mattered posed in the form of a panel discussion in a Trinity discussion series titled Behind the Headlines. As a participant on the panel, I pointed to the dangers of trivializing race as had been the case in the popular press, and that race was not merely a matter of epidermalization or colonial subjection, but in its current form of global intensification had become deeply ingrained in the expansion of technological resources. To make my point, I reflected on Faustus in Africa, a collaboratively, collaboratively conceived theatrical work by William Kentridge and the Handspring Puppet Company, about which I had been writing in a somewhat different register at the time. Faustus in Africa proved sufficient for my efforts to argue the case of race and imperialism in post-colonial Ireland. The 1995 reenactment of Goethe's 1830s version of Faustus seemed to make intelligible a reading of race as the justification that lay behind imperial conquest. A form of biopolitics coupled with the imperial excess, the play revealed how the specter of race that buoyed colonial expansion ultimately fed the European appetite of conspicuous consumption. I opted to read the wager between God and Mephistopheles in the opening scenes as a wager on the subsumption of race to class, where race is ultimately subsumed to the imperial project through a process of education, of the education of desire. While useful to show how race defined our shared post-colonial modernity as a supplement of economic globalization, I admittedly approached the play as a limited and predictable plot of a chronicle of a death foretold. I viewed it somewhat expediently for the purposes of a public talk um, that extended a familiar account in the story of the rise of apartheid as a view on the receding horizon of apartheid on that colonial and imperial past through which it was constituted. As I mulled over the questions, I gradually realized that the historicist grid through which I had interpreted Faustus in Africa was the same grid that produced the large-scale belief that Ireland was free of the problem of race. Something about the historicist rendering of the problem of race troubled me in subsequent days. The discomfort was left, was felt more intensely when another fortuitous encounter in the National Gallery of Ireland led me to Francis Danby's 1828 epic rendering of the abolition of slavery in the opening of the sixth seal. I'm going to ask for the image to just be shown of this. Few works of art keep watch over the drama of a changing world picture over two centuries in as striking a manner as Danby's opening of the sixth seal. The vast, intricate, and ever-darkening canvas currently on display at the Irish National Gallery is a work of both another time and ours. There is much left to say about Danby's painting, and much more to consider about its circulation, ownership, and the debate the work generated in a fledgling 19th century public sphere. For example, one such detail relates to how the painting was raffled in a lottery, with prints given to prospective competitors of the prize painting, thereby radically altering the market in art and exhibition. The opening combines two elements in its composition the abolition of slavery on the one hand, and a lightning bolt breaching the growing chasm between heaven and earth, signaling the coterminous revolution in communication technologies in the 1830s. Often read as a representation of the onset of an apocalyptic world picture, the painting has long served as a reminder of disorder and degradation associated with the displacement of slave labor by industrial technology. It bore the traces of an age of uncertainty and foreboding not too dissimilar to ours. For the purposes of this discussion, I wish to call attention to one small but consequential, consequential detail about the painting. Brendan Rooney, the curator at the National Gallery, narrates how the painting was mutilated while it was on display in Rochdale, England in 1843. Rooney has spent several years reflecting on the debates, scholarly and public, about the reason for, for the excising of the unshackled slave at the center of the piece. It's going to be a bit difficult to see this, but I, I, I'm going to ask you to trust my vision over yours. <laughs> in its current display in the National Public Institution in Dublin, 
One notices with a little effort the stitch with which Danby restored the work and returned the figure of the emancipated slave to the scene from which it had been excised. The mutilation of Danby's painting is indeed crucial, in part because it reveals the sources of the apocalyptic in the work of art. On this read, the slave, I would argue, receives its full subjective meaning as slave only once it is re-sutured and stitched back into the canvas. Since Danby's opening anticipates the revolution in communication technologies, I suggest in the larger study of which this is a part, that the story of the excision and the re-suturing of the slave leaves its imprint on this technological feat. Communication technologies, insofar as they are anti-entropic, mimic the process of mutilation and re-suturing. In short, Danby's painting accidentally arrives on the scene of history in the 1830s, whereupon it finds the source of the ap apocalyptic in the appropriation of the figure of the slave as signifier of race and capacity to the circular causality of communication technology. Danby's painting substantially recast my appreciation for Faustus in Africa. Recall the opening scene in the clearinghouse replete with newly invented instruments of communication to drive the project of empire. Recall also the scene about communication between heaven and earth that repeats the apocalyptic setting of Danby's opening. Faustus in Africa re-narrates the problem of apartheid as a product of a technogenesis that set race on a new cause of the becoming technical of the human. In this technogenesis, race never entirely disappears, but threatens to return in a feedback loop. Through the prosthesis of the puppet and the cinematic, as well as the means of communication, the play cautions to prepare for the uncanny returns of race in what Hannah Arendt once called the co-evolution of human and machine. More than a critique of imperialism or a reductive concept of, a, a reductive critique of racism, Faustus in Africa asks for an aesthetic education in our times, one that promotes an industrial politics of technologies of the spirit. And I want to emphasize this because in part, I think that what I draw on in Faustus in Africa is an opportunity to rethink the concept of aesthetic education in a moment of technogenesis and technological overdetermination. So in some sense, with race locked in the circular causality, we might have available to us a, an aesthetic education that returns us to the question of the technologies of the spirit. To this end, I want to argue that Faustus in Africa and many of the four plays that I'm, I'm deeply invested in are, are set to work on preparing the sensory equipment for the uncanny returns of race. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Pramesh. Um, Pramesh mentioned that he's busy on a book on the four plays by uh, collaborative works with William and the Handspring Puppet Company at the moment. So a little context to that. Um, Nkuli, um, I've asked you to be a respondent um, to, I don't know if you immediately have any responses to any of the, the positions that has been presented here. Is it? Okay, I just uh, have a comment and it kind of ties together with some of what Michael and Andrew and Pramesh said and, um, but it looks at the, uh, the, the works of the procession outside of the animation and the performances and the way that they become this kind of suspended moment and outside of sort of very clear references how um, anybody can read what they want into it so they can become disenfranchised persons that are in Johannesburg or in Eastern Europe and so this kind of shadow that opens up the meaning to be read in any kind of ways what makes the work in a way kind of profound but also sort of removes it um, from any kind of specificity and um, and then it also creates kind of different entry points to somebody who has the different kinds of entry points that um, you know Michael would have and to somebody else who is maybe 25 or whatever and doesn't have those accesses. So you can kind of read uh, and implicate yourself in the work and so in terms of what um, understandings you, you get out of it, I think. I, I think it's a very interesting point and I, uh, what I also want, 
A, a position, though, that I think we should interrogate a little bit. It's like that, that one thing excludes another. That, you know, we can have uh, a, a kind of nuanced, in-depth, you know, exclusive conversation even. Why does it need to exclude all other kinds of accesses and experiences too? So, um, and maybe to articulate a little bit, and this more to, towards what Andrew kind of like presented here, is that that speaks also to certain limitations of the institution of art um, and its accessibility. But, you know, like I think also those kind of debates has been, you know, we've been around the room a couple of times on those, and not to say that they redundant and not necessary, and this, this constant interrogation. But these levels of interpretation and then mis misinterpretation, and is that not inherently part of the work? But I also think, like, why should we not defend certain spaces for a kind of, you know, a, a particular kind of conversation and debate, and that the one doesn't exclude the other, uh, if I repeat my point a little bit. But what I do appreciate also from Andrew is to, uh, to also place William in, uh, in, the, in the kind of the notion of, the pop of popular culture, which I think is, not, is a very fresh take as well. Um, but I think, you know, from coming to your point, Pramesh, also, I think to also um, look at, at, at William's work as a, a reading or a, a process of also unpacking and understanding race, I think has been uh, maybe ties to our earlier conversation as well, that we kind of need to delve deeper into that, and that's maybe kind of a bit of a question to to the panel here. Can we talk a little bit about that in more more detail, um, um, how race features in, in William's work? Anybody want to jump off? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you go. I suppose you know, we could be really s flippant and say uh, when race appears in William's work, it's generally in black and white. Um, and I mean, but I'm, I'm, that sounds flippant, but that, that, that there is something in there. Um, the very act of production is an act of erasure, mm. right? And I'm not suggesting that, that Kentridge is trying to um, erase histories, but this is why I was uncomfortable with this word trauma in, in here, because I mean, the only trauma I see visible been represented in much of William's work is, is the trauma of the mass of this population of this country, working class black people, essentially. And it's n not that he has gone to uh, delved too deeply into this in recent years, but you know, when you look back at those drawings for projection, I don't think, I don't think a white heterosexual male artist would be able to speak on behalf of the crowd in the way that William took it upon himself to speak on behalf of the crowd at that time. That's, that's not because, uh, that's, not, that's, not a, that's, that's a product of the times that he and I um, uh, came out of as privileged white South Africans. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult to talk, for me to talk about race in this. So I think what we should talk about is whiteness the fact that William is white and male and heterosexual, and that has something to do with an outlook. And also, if I may say, privileged, extremely privileged um, in terms of his, um, his both intellectual milieu and, and I'm, I imagine, also um, a financial and economic milieu. And so that's where I think I can talk about race, is that it comes very much from, as I said before, in my, basically the substance of my, of my presentation, it comes from a position of Eurocentrism. Uh, it's, it's become, but, but Andrew, yeah. those are not the same. I'm sorry, like, let's unpack it. Let's not also conflate that. No, I so I, I don't know, Pramesh, do you have any comments? I, I do have one thing, and I'm, for, for once in my life, I'm going to dare to disagree with you. Um, and in part because, you know, I think that there's a way in which one is always an accomplished to a reading, you know, um, and, and in that sense, you know, as I think about the four plays, one thinks about Wojciech on the High Felt, Faustus in Africa, Ubu and the Truth Commission, and uh, Confessions of Zeno. They reference very, very particular moments in the genealogy of a concept of race. So I'm, I'm very concerned about the reductive engagement with the concept of race as a, con as a concept of play. And yeah, I, that's why I was nodding earlier when Ashraf was, was, was speaking. Um, because I, I think that, you know, that is a dead end. You know, I mean, this is a concept that has, you know, that if one takes Stuart Hall, might be thought of as a free-floating signifier that has attached to all mechanisms and conditions of power all around the world. 
So I would say that we need a more, a, a ca more careful rendering of the genealogy of race. The two plays, Buechner's and uh, Goethe's, are written in, a, in the midst of the abolition of slavery. And it is intriguing that at that very moment, John Herschel at the Cape has joined together with several others in constituting a massive revolution uh, in, in communication technologies. And you know, it would be very interesting to think about how race gets reconscripted to the kind of means of technological communication in the, post, in the moment after, 18, after 1834. Just one small moment, the, the Ubu and the uh, uh, Zeno are moments when the major debates on Gestalt are unfolding in, in Germany. This is pre-fascism. We are trapped in the midst of an apartheid that was educated in the Gestalt moment. In other words, Verwut had ended up in Leipzig in 1926, where he was engaged in a massive uh, project around um, emotional susceptibility or psychological susceptibility. He was part of the debate between Leipzig and Berlin. I mean, those were the first experiments on behavioral psychology. So I would say that what is available to us in these plays is an opportunity to offer a different genealogy of race, to think about what might be possible in disavowing its, 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 its uh, continuities in, in South Africa. In other words, to reconstitute an episteme uh, in thinking the post-apartheid. Can I briefly respond just to that? Yes, very briefly. Very briefly. I just want to say, no, uh, then I apologize, because there's a mistake in my, and you're quite right about the completion. I completely agree with you, which is why I say that, you know, we need to unpack these in more detail. We don't have the time to do it here. Um, it's not a, it was not my, in my comments were not intended in any way to be a, a discourse of blame. Um, it's more a discourse of my own complicity as a viewer of a similar, a similar generation and, 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 and level of privilege to, yeah, to kill this. Yeah, please do. I mean, we're all unlearning our privilege. Yeah. Mm. I mean, every opportunity at literacy is an opportunity also of unlearning privilege. I mean, this is a post-colonial injunction, now. unlearn your privilege. Gayatri Spivak gave it to us, we do it all the time. I mean, there cannot be a reading without a process of unlearning privilege. I'm worried about taking on burden. I think, you know, we're dealing with a construct here that is much, much more fundamental to, to grapple with than to kind of take it on board as a certain kind of problem of the self. And so, so yeah, so I'm saying, you know, you know, the, the shift that I'm trying to, move to, to inaugurate here is a shift from the epidermis to the technogenesis. And, and, you know, I think if we don't create this distance, there will be no race uh, other than one that consumes us. I, I would like to um, ask Michael, you know, a, a point that you um, kind of made about this uh, con relates to history and kind of William's engagement with, with history as you know, a larger subject, but also something that haunts in the work in, in many ways. Um, but, you know, the mural, for example, that was, that would, that's receding or kind of disappearing over time, the inscription um, in the shield of the victory. Do you mind talking a little bit about um, historic processes in William's work and how he also contributes to a process of historicization, if, if you may? quite large. Um, <laughs> cool. um, it, it seems to me that the, the is this working? Yeah. The, the, the Crowns and Laments project is, confronts history, confronts the certainty of received opinion, received facts, and unpacks it, and unpacks it in certain ways, in, 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 in many ways. Um, primarily it says that so long as one thinks that X, Y, and Z happened, that one tends to exclude A, B, and C. And William's project is to a large extent to, to return A, B, and C to consideration and to see that, um, that, 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 that this is uh, equally part of what one is experiencing in, in, in visiting Rome. But I think the, the, the project is much larger than that. It's more, it, it's more complicated than that. And it's the very materiality of his forms that um, also, uh, uh, also are relevant. Um, in this instance, of course, what he's talking about is that the, the, it, it's made out of mud, it's made out of grime, grime that will soon be covered and in 10 years or so will make it disappear. But in fact, that particular fact about the, uh, the Triumphs and Mets mural ties in with the whole concern that it seems to me that um, William is involved in, 
and that is the provision, provisionality of knowledge. Mm -hmm. That um, his very openness in his charcoal medium, his um, refusal to use color, his um, what he calls Stone Age animation, mm. um, all of these features in his work are saying this exists from this point of view, but not from that point of view. This exists for this moment, but not for the next moment. It is no, the truth is, 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 is provisional in that sense. It's, it, it is negotiated in a sense. Um, and his experiments in different forms of representation, his use, for example, of uh, medical instruments of diagnosis, for example, says that this is actually true. This is a body that you can see through an X-ray. You think you can see it through a form, as it were, but actually this is equally true, what one sees inside the figure. Um, those anamorphic drawings, for example, he's saying, it seems to me, he's saying that it's only in this way can one make sense out of something which makes nonsense. And that also is provisional. That's also one view out of many that one could be making. So it seems to me that he's, he's, he's engaging with, he's, he's subverting anything that one is comfortable with. And uh, presumably the categories that we're busy talking about at the moment as well would, uh, would fall into that. As, uh, yeah. Thank you. Mkuli, um, a little bit prompted by Andrew's proposition about the kind of potential misreading or context and how a viewer or somebody just walked past you know, misinterpretation and all of those possibilities. You have worked also in international context, and I'm just very curious about, as a curator, how you how you think about the kind of context of projects that you make, how one mediates that. Um, what do we, um, you know, what do we assume is inherent in the message that we create, and how much, you know. How do we mediate that as, as cultural, you know, um, workers or curators or artists? Yeah. Um, I mean, I support what Andrew said about um, that you cannot separate that William's work and when it speaks about race is in black and white, first in the illustrations and so on, but also in the fact that, as Andrew said, he's white, male, and privileged, and his subjects are disenfranchised. Well, how we, we can maybe create the race for them because they're shadows and you can project from different contexts and so on. And to say, as Pramesh Dalu, that um, you know, we cannot just speak about the epidermis and so on, this is not very helpful. Um, certainly, when I consider my projects, and for example, I can speak about the Tell Freedom project that we did in the Netherlands, it was about interrogating the, their history with South Africa and also understanding that in their uh, schools and, and history books, they don't actually um, engage with the colonialism that the Netherlands performed in South Africa and other African countries, as well as the colonialism that they performed in South America. So for them, uh, there's a kind of a social amnesia because somehow the general population is not aware of this, but they are able to, to uh, vilify perhaps the British and the Germans and whoever else is, might be trying to take responsibility for their actions. And so the project was a, a proposition to say, if we are here are so concerned about what um, the history is between you know, the uh, settlers and, and, uh, the, and, and the creation of the present moment and apartheid and so on, and you are actually uh, want to hold another's place uh, responsible or, or in some way, and they are in denial about this, then uh, is it worth the shouting? How do you begin to have a different kind of conversation with a space that denies that it has performed this violence um, when you are the one who has experienced it? So it's, it speaks to those kinds of complexities. And, um, and if we always try to kind of uh, remove that and not talk about it, we remain kind of um, then in a strange kind of vacuum where we are shouting things out that is not being responded to. So you, you're creating some kind of um, um, uh, feedback loop that does, is not generative. So how, if we then go and create this project in the Netherlands that puts it, uh, for them a kind of a perspective of this is what has happened and they're like, oh, we're sorry, we were not aware. What does this mean? I mean, where do you begin the conversation uh, when someone says, I'm sorry, I'm not aware 
oh, it can't have been, we didn't think it was that bad. We went and we volunteered and we thought we were doing something good um, in, in later years. And this is, we can then bring that back here to South Africa where there's a kind of um, in denialism as well, um, either from, you know, different parties within say, uh, you know, we can't talk about race or we can't talk about these black and white issues when uh, they're still quite important and you cannot just simply dismiss them. Um, and so together this and, you know, other kinds of questions, yeah, build up to something, I don't know. Permission, yeah, certainly. Well, I, you know, so I'm, I'm not asking us not to talk about race. In fact, that these days I find myself only talking about race. I mean, I, that's all I've been thinking is how one exits these scripts, you know, of, of utter despair and what I'm calling a Thano pol politics, you know, a drift, a death drive that is an overdrive, if you like, you know. And I'm, I'm, con I'm wanting us to think about race differently. And, I'm, and, and in that sense, I'm wondering whether the model that we're thinking about apartheid, you know, the critique of apartheid, which includes, you know, one of my critiques of some of William's work is that it's extremely Rand-centric. So rather than Eurocentrism, it's, there's a Rand-centrism, you know, and, and one wonders, you know, what happened to the Eastern Cape, what one happened, you know, to all of these other spaces in this country. Um, or in this geography. Uh, so, you know, but those are questions for another time. I'm wondering whether, you know, this tendency to think apartheid as derivative of late coloniality is adequate, given the way in which a certain kind of, firstly, condition of slavery uh, marked the onset of a racial formation in the southern part of the country. Uh, but more importantly, you know, in the way in which a certain kind of technological uh, process had constituted race uh, in, in, in varied ways across the two centuries. So all I'm asking for is an intensification of a reading of the problem, a, a speaking differently about it so that it can be grasped because there is going to be an uncanny return of race. And, and you know, I'm, I'm wanting us to think about an aesthetic education that is a preparation of the sensory mechanisms to deal with the return, with that uncanny return. And I think the work that uh, William has done with Handspring is a classic example of how we might think about the prosthesis as a way to think about uncanny returns. And you know, yeah, I'm thinking about the Japanese scholar Masahiro Mori, who, who, was to, who once said, you know, that when the robot begins to resemble the human, you know, that's a moment of an uncanny valley, you know. And I, I want us to think very carefully about what the racial condition looks like in that moment of, of the uncanny. I mean, there's a, there's a very serious set of questions, um, you know, in which the question of technology cannot be ignored now. I mean, we have to take it on board and we have to think of its kind of emergence and its genesis in a, you know, in a more careful way. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going open to the floor. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, it's getting a little dark in the room, so I can't really see very well, so... Um, Ashraf, you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Any comments? Yes. Uh, hello, Storm. I just want to know, why did you put trauma in the title? Why did, <laughs> why did, why did we put trauma? Because nobody talks about trauma. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the trauma was in the title. Just to, it was also, we, we presented the titles as very broad frameworks, um, so invited the respondents or the, you know, t to respond as they wish, and so I'm sorry we didn't exactly specifically talk about trauma, um, but I think it did come through in some of the other panels um, strongly as well. Um, I'd like to make a comment about trauma if I can. Um, I'd like to start by using Margaret Iverson's definition of it. Um, trauma is something which has failed to achieve a representation, but yet which continues to haunt the subject. And I'd like to think about um, something that Kentridge talks about as a moment when he came across the box of photographs of his father's, which were going to be used as evidence in one of the trials. And I think a lot has been said about um, the scopic regime of the Enlightenment, and particularly the scopic regime of apartheid. We've talked about how we get past an epidermalization, etc. And I think a productive way to think about erasure and what perhaps in a very subjective way Kentridge may have attempted to recuperate 
is something like the trauma of a primal scene of a subject in formation uh, living at a time of the hypervigilance of uh, state machinery which was conditioned through the visual and that some uh, his intense exploration of the technologies of sight may in fact have been in quite a foundational way a response to that moment. So I'd like to say we could recuperate the concept of trauma in thinking about Gentridge's work. Thank you very much. Any comments about that? Respondents, thank you. Um, we have any other comments in the back? Tammy. Thank you. Um, thank you to all, th all speakers, all four, for very interesting things. I feel kind of duty-bound to reply to some of the things that Andrew said. Um, it always irked me enormously that my father's favorite work of mine was Another Country, the film made with Mango Groove, which uses a repetition of images I'd used in other films, which has a sentimental rainbow uh, nation projection of South Africa, the opposite of everything which I'd be interested, been interested in terms of ambiguity and paradox. And it certainly made me determined, having done that film, never to do another one like that. And I think part of the allure of the film was certainly the erotics of Claire Johnson's soft gray jersey that she wears <laughs> while singing the song. So, but I want to talk about a couple of other things. There are harder questions, and those are real questions for me of what you describe as Eurocentrism. It's true that the works that I've based a lot of my work on are European classics, German classics for an you know, a large number of um, Mozart, Alban Berg, Goethe, um, and then there's been Italo Svevo, so they have. That, that, is, that is completely true, but in general, they've been looked at through the lens of what it is to grow up in Johannesburg. And I think the ac accusation that it's a, a rand-centric uh, is completely true. And, you know, the rand and the landscape feels familiar. The Eastern Cape, I understand its <coughs> importance, but it's not something I know. In Johannesburg at the moment, we have, or around Johannesburg, the phenomenon of the zamazama informal artisanal miners, which for me is a kind of a kind of a prescient view of what's going to happen in the rest of the world, where the informal economy has to survive on its own because the formal economy is collapsing, and that's visible around Johannesburg in a very immediate way. So there's a kind of naturalism. And Andrew, you're right that in the time that we grew up, certainly that I grew up, there was a sense of all attempts at looking at traditional Africa were completely tainted by the nationalist policy of saying, that's what Africans were. And that European books, if it was written by a European author, was only for Europeans to, to read. And a house and a film and a gramophone was for Europeans and a mud hut was for Africans. And part of the fight against apartheid from childhood onwards was to say, no, the great works of the world, whether they're from South America or they're from Japan or they're from the Cameroon, are not restricted simply to the people who made them and the people around them. And so there is this ambiguity and this p continuing paradoxical question of does the work come out of Europe? And certainly, obviously, it comes out of a white, male, heterosexual, Jewish, 63-year-old viewpoint from a Johannesburg suburb. You can narrow it as neat as you like. And I would never dream of saying I'm going to speak with the voice of an unemployed black woman because I can know her experience. And I think in this case, there's a question which we don't have time for today between the difference between empathy, which seems a very difficult concept to pretend that you can feel the same as someone else, and sympathy, which is a fellow feeling alongside acknowledging the gap, as it was described early on. But the only thing that I really do want to respond to is the question of popular culture. Um, and also, come on, a kiss. Just think of a secret kiss, the softness of lips, the exchange of pheromones, the saliva, the risk that you're going to be caught, the jeopardy that you're in. 
no picture is going to compete with that for excitement <laughs> for pudding. That's an, unfair, that's an unfair test to give away. But the other one that has to do with fitting in with popular culture. I've seen the film that you've, that you've described, which is about adolescence, about body hair and masturbation and all of those things, and it is foul. It is foul. It is a kind of pornography, not because it is dealing with the subject, because it deals with them without any risk, without acknowledging within those things of adolescence. You to think of the trauma of adolescence. And it does it in the way that men tell locker room stories, the jokes about these conditions and about those things. And it's, it's interesting that it's a specifically American Netflix kind of film in which it's it says, what is the thing we can do that will give no real offense? In the same way that comedy programs have canned laughter, this has kind of canned transgression. Not a real transgression, but as if you've been transgressive by laughing at someone being embarrassed about armpit hairs. And I think to say that one's work should try to be like living with the Kardashians, or Big Brother, or Survivor 23, is setting a very low task of what artists can do in trying to make sense of the world. And I think a lot of work does have to accept that it's at the margins. It cannot compete with the juggernauts of that kind of mass culture. I mean, the, the Tate Modern in Britain only has five million visitors a year. It can't compete with the hundreds of millions that are going to watch these popular shows on television. But it's a substantial margin. And I think to say that that margin is without value because it's not the same as the largest grouping of what American advertising, production, um, and selling its products all over the world, that it can't compete with that, is not to diminish the importance of the work that happens um, in the margins. And I do have a sense that this question also of Eurocentrism and Afrocentrism is a complex one. Is colonialism an African question? Is it a European question? Is the question of the war in Ethiopia simply an African or simply a European question, they're completely imbricated. And I think it's that imbrication, even if it is going through a series of European classics through which it is looked at, that imbrication is, is an important one. Thank you. Thank you. I just want thank to say thank you, may I just say thank you to okay. William for that. I really, <clears throat> I really appreciate you taking my comments as seriously as you have. And I mean, it's obviously a conversation which we'd have to have in off offline or in a different form. And I, I do appreciate um, uh, you, you taking my point seriously and responding to them in the way that you have, even though we might disagree. And I'm very pleased that I have similar schmaltzy tastes as, um, as a Sydney. So if that's the case, I'm very happy. But we'll, we'll continue it. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are going to get ready for the next session. Yeah. Um, oh, so, sorry, uh, sorry, I oh. can't see you. Okay. Uh, it's okay. Um, I want to take on a, a remark made from the woman behind me over there about trauma. Um, the remark was trauma is a, is a failure to achieve a representation but continues to haunt the subject. I find that a very, very interesting formulation in the light of a number of debates, particularly ones presented by Pramesh Lalu. Because I would argue that trauma is actually taken on the form of representation in a very dangerous way in currently in terms of populism and the manufacture of identity politics. That actually that's how traumatism through a, a diversion, trauma through a diversion occupies a new centrality in our lives. And I wanted to ask you what you thought about that, if that is a viable way. Because yes, race consciousness is a symptomatic reaction to a haunted body. Um, whether white or black. Um, but the thing is, one must recognize it as a haunting and not as a, a, a means, therefore, to proselytize a future. Because as you're arguing, that actually we must move beyond the epidermis and all the other linked associated conditions associated with that idea of race to uh, a technogenesis. And I'm not sure whether you've actually read um, uh, Sheila Mbembe's book, The Critique of Black Reason. Um, uh, uh, and a t tragically maligned thinker of major import today, easily dismissed because of the complexity of the argument that he's, uh, he's giving. 
And I think we need that complexity, which is what you're asking for. And what's happening at the moment is a reductiveness that has assumed a new order. And I think your remark about trauma seems to has helped me to think about this issue. Do you want to respond, Pramesh? Yeah, please do. Uh, just grab a mic. Um. So, so thank you, Ashraf. I mean, I think that is, you know, some of the, you know, the, the work that I would like to do. I mean, part of it is, you know, I'm drawing on, I mean, Fanon had a big worry about epiterminalization and what he called lactification. I mean, there, there's a whole discourse on this. But I, I just want to say something about, you know, an earlier generation of nationalist thinkers. And I do worry about the insular South African mind. And I'm thinking here about someone like Charlotte Mapleke. And, you know, uh, Philip Miller and Tutuka Sibisi did a whole work on the 1891 choir. But Makeke is absolutely fundamental to the way Du Bois rearranges his thought on race and Africa. And I'm wondering about, you know, what's happening in the space of that set of exchanges. You know, where in some sense, you know, are we able to speak into the problem of global apartheid? In fact, what we are trying to do is to domesticate apartheid. We want to produce a more efficient version of apartheid. And I worry about that symptom deeply. Thank you. Um, on that note, um, Tammy, thank you very much to the panels and your positions. Thank you very much. <laughs>